Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the viewers of uh, our podcast, uh, Press You for Happiness. Alhamdulillah, this is uh, the fourth year continuously that we are making efforts in delivering a message to the community. Uh, this year, we've tried to make it more diverse with new subjects, more challenging subjects, and particularly in the, uh, the last few days, um, those that are following regularly know that we started speaking on of the Palestinian uh, conflict, its origin, its history, and the legalities behind that. And yesterday's podcast was an extension of that going into a mentioning of the rise of Islamophobia since then. Our closing remarks uh, last night was were that there was a lack of political will and political awareness in our community. So for that reason, I requested Hamabai, who's on my left, that he would give us more time. Alhamdulillah, he did so. Uh, he's a, a, a very generous individual for giving us that time as well. Um, so we will be hearing from him. But our new panelist that I want to introduce first, on my far right hand side, is Nasrullah Khan Mughal Sahib, uh, who has been part and parcel of the community for a very, very, very long time. He has a wealth of experience. And the reason why I called Nusullah Sa was because of his background in politics, his impact he's had, and the role that he can play. And we want to really hear from his experience. So today's podcast really is awareness building and educating our community on their legal rights, the power the vote holds, and discussions around uh, politically educating our, our our community. So let me head off straight to Ahmad Bhai, I think who wants to introduce Mughal Sahib in a bit more detail as they also go back. Uh, so Ahmad Bhai, Bismillah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa So Mughal Sahib, uh, let me start by asking you, uh, you came to the UK in the 60s. Yes. So tell me a bit about what the environment was like for you as a Muslim and what did you experience when you came to the UK? Well, it was a very difficult uh, situation at that time. I came in 1966 uh, to do my A-levels and then for, after that I went into university, three years of university. The main problem at that time was food. We oh, could okay. not get our food, halal food. So we really had to survive, myself and many others, students on fish and chips right on a daily basis fish and chips or egg and chips true british and really Bangladesh. you get fed up after a while <laughs> uh, but you have to eat and mm. uh, that's that's what uh, what drove us so in terms of when you came to study at uh, college and then further to university yes how did you find uh, being probably one of the very few brown people at the time in the 60s and how was the environment for you uh, how did you find the attitude to towards you from your fellow students and then from your teachers well actually I, I had no problems at all I mean I, I felt quite at home um, I was welcomed by everybody uh, but I also became active in the student politics as well mm. so when I was at the university I was a uh, a representative, one of the representatives of the student movement uh, to negotiate with the uh, authorities of the university on how students can be uh, awarded or rewarded on the hard work they do on a continuous basis rather than just an annual examination. Um, and uh, there were a lot of protests in the 70s um, in the 60s, early 60s, the late 60s, what came out of that one was, success was that uh, continuous assessment became part and parcel of how people were judged for their degrees. Right. It wasn't just an annual examination. Sure. It was, a, a, you know, monthly uh, assignments and those were marked and you, that's how you actually got your uh, marks. Sorry. 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 Uh, so, so, so really, I, I did not have any difficulty in as people would have expected, have discrimination or anything like that. Mm. No, I didn't feel, I didn't uh, suffer any of that in my student life. 
in your student life. Okay, so you went to university and you studied, uh, you know, what? I studied aeronautical engineering. It was my passion to, my space was my passion, and I wanted to get into the space industry. Okay. And so I studied aeronautical engineering. Um, did, you, did you then pursue that? Well, I could not, because I, co I could not actually get a job in the aircraft industry at that time. Uh, so I had to go for my second passion, which was gas gas engineering. Uh, so my first job was in gas engineering in the Midlands. So I did a lot of work in the Midlands on special projects. On, so let me take you just a step back. Yes. Um, so you said you couldn't get into uh, the aeronautical engineering industry. Um, you know, why was that? I think there was an issue with the Ministry of Defence. I'm talking about before 1970. So, right. you know, when you're in the university in the last year, you start looking for jobs. In 1969, I was looking for jobs and I was offered a job by Hawker Sidley um, Aircraft Industry in Hull. Mm -hmm. um, and they were offering new graduates uh, at higher levels than you could get anywhere else in the industry. Uh, but that was subject to the Ministry of Defense giving me a clearance. And unfortunately, they did not give me a security clearance. So I could not work on the designing of the Harrier jet at that time. Right. Um, but um, Hawker Siddeley then said they could continue with that offer, but in a production line, which I did not fancy. I wanted to design things rather than just build things. Right. So that's why I did not, I could not pursue mm -hmm. that. So were you given any reasons why no. you couldn't be given security clearance? There's no the reason. Time? The reason came along after 1976 when the Race Relations Act was passed. In right. 1976, then it became illegal <coughs> to discriminate people on the basis of race. But the answer was given by a Polish person uh, who had taken, uh, asked a question in Parliament why was his son declined an officership in the Royal Air Force? Is that pre-1970s? Yeah, yeah. The, I'm talking about 1972, three, four, okay. at that time, before 1976. Mm -hmm. right. um, and the answer he got in Parliament was that he was not a Briton. Mm -hmm. okay. He was not a Briton. He was not born as a British person. Mm -hmm. He was Polish. Uh, but his father... Being Pol Polish had fought for the British Air Force, Royal Air Force, against the Germans. And he had served in the Air Force like that. Mm -hmm. But his son could not become an officer. But this is not before 1976. Since then, things have changed. Uh, but now I realize now why I was not cleared, because I was not a Briton. Mm -hmm. So the defense ministry did not trust me to be a faithful person although when I was when I was a British citizen yeah so okay uh, let me then ask you now um, so you then went into the gas industry and yes. you've been involved in various uh, stages in your life in politics uh, uh, you know locally and uh, somewhat on you know nationally as well yes nationally um, Europe -wide. so if you briefly highlight for the viewers and for us what your local roles were and what your national activities were in yeah. politics well uh, I told you I started off in uh, gas engineering I did that work for five years then I was interested in, in computers and uh, they got a job in International Computers Limited in Manchester so I moved to Manchester back uh, to do that work. And then I settled in Manchester in 1980. Uh, when I settled, I decided to take part in local politics and joined the Labour Party. And I did a lot of work within the party, particularly in two issues. One was the education policy of the party and the other one was on the uh, real equal opportunities, opportunities for uh, communities. So those are the two areas where I specialized within the party itself. Um, and then I got elected uh, in 1986 uh, in, from Longsight in Manchester. Um, and I was also, I got elected three times. So I was served for 12 years. Mm. Uh, while I was on the council, I took on the responsibility of equal opportunities and part of education. 
um, I was the chair of the Equal Opportunities Committee at that time. So I was one of the cabinet members in, in actually ensuring equalities of opportunities for all people within our communities. By being in Manchester, I also, we then joined the Association of Metropolitan Authorities, which met in London, and I became the chair of the uh, Equal Opportunities Committee of that nationally. So I was able to uh, work nationally as well. Uh, my passion also took me into the European Union. I joined the European Union Migrants Forum based in Brussels um, for a number of years, for about, I think, 15 years. For four years, I was, the, well, I was one of the vice presidents of the European Union Migrants Forum. You know, let uh, me ask you, so, so, so why did you actually choose the Labour Party? Why not the Conservatives or the Lib Dems? What was no, the attraction? I've always been fascinated by uh, socialism and socialist uh, activities. Uh, my early childhood was in Kenya. Uh, I did schooling in Kenya. And one of the things what I found out was, as an Asian, I could go to school wearing a uniform, having shoes, and actually going to this classroom where I could sit at a chair and table mm. with a proper blackboard. Mm. At the same time, I could see black children who did not have any shoes. They would walk barefoot to the school, and in their school, they did not have desks and chairs. They had just forms. They sat on the forms, and one side of the room was a blackboard, and that's how they studied. Whereas if you're a white student, you had uh, the type of classrooms were like you find in Europe. Uh, so really, uh, at that time I realized that for every one pound which is spent on a black child, about four pounds were spent on an Asian child, and about eight pounds were spent on a white child. Mm, mm. And so that built, uh, built me, uh, really my thinking was really formed by that, that why was there discrimination, why was there not equality, um, and really that, that passion drove me to get into politics because that's where the power is. The only thing you can do from the outside is just ask people and become a pressure force, whereas if you want to do certain things, you need to be in power. So let me then take you into your career then as a councillor in Manchester for the Labour Party yes. and being in the conversation in the corridors of power uh, where decisions are made. Uh, what impact did you think or do you think when you look back that you were able to have? Was your voice actually heard? Were, were um, um, others attentive to ideas that you were putting forward? I did two or three things. One was I uh, started a process of having workshops. Uh, the party was very keen on having workshops uh, and also working parties. So I led the working party on equal opportunities and also one on education. There was education as was primary education, secondary education. Uh, remember in Manchester, uh, half the budget was spent on education. One quarter was spent on social social services, and the other quarter was spent on other other activities. And because there's a lot of money was was being spent, I wanted to make sure it was spent in the right way. So we actually uh, managed to get the authorities to recognize equalities and to work with equalities issues. Um, and I was able to draw up race equality plans and how to monitor those. Um, uh, if you remember, there was an issue with the Burnage High School at that time. Um, I was a councillor at that time and I was uh, leading the from the council side on that. So we, after that, we changed the whole setup in the schools and that Burnage School became a model for other schools to follow. We made sure that pupils were actually looked at equally um, and uh, that uh, resources were spent on an equitable basis. So we were able to, as a councillor, 
uh, I was able to convince my colleagues that we needed to put extra resources in equalities as well. One of the major things we undertook in equalities was uh, dropping the curbs on, at cross sections sure. for roads. It costs money. It is not easy to find money to actually do that. In the budget, you have to uh, argue for your own budget. Uh, education provision for special educational needs, uh, you have to have a special a budget for that. And uh, with the uh, at that time, you know, uh, the central government was cutting funding from the council, so but we had to re preserve certain services, and education was one of those major major ones. Mm -hmm. There were social services as well, but my concern was particularly about education and equalities. Yeah. In equalities, we did such good work that people used to come from places like Liverpool, London, even Berlin, and uh, Barcelona would come to Manchester to learn how we deal with equalities, how we've been able to do that. What uh -huh. inspired your kind of proposal on how to have an equal society, right? So when you were making, you said you, you basically transitioned Burnage School into a bit of a model for other schools. Yeah. What was inspiring that thinking? What the model that you were proposing, was it, you know, a certain idea across the world or... What really well, the idea was uh, how we need to learn from the rest of the world mm. as to how we can improve our, our education. One of the things we could learn from was the Caribbean, particularly in Caribbean. The education in Caribbean was even better than the one you could find in the UK. So we had to learn from that. Um, and remember, many teachers came from the Caribbean. Um, similar thing was going on in, in uh, uh, South Asia. But South Asia had lost its way, as, as, as I see it. They did not progress, whereas Caribbean was progressing. Um, so we've made those, those links. Um, and really, this is where the whole issue about how do you think make things happen? And as, as a leading person in Manchester, I was able to talk to conferences, because there's a con national conferences taking place in the UK. There are party party conferences as well, uh, in the Labour Party particularly, uh, I was able to present what Manchester does. Um, I can remember one conference in Brussels I went to and we took some booklets from Manchester which we have prepared how different communities work together and uh, those booklets were really, went like hotcakes in Brussels. Um, in other words, the people were actually beginning, were curious to know how do you get people together? Mm. And I think the issue was you work with people, you spend your time with people, you put a lot of your own effort and time into people, and then people will actually work with you. And that is the, I think if you were looking for a, an equation, that is the equation which we used to bring people together and to, uh, to make things happen. And I think my other colleagues uh, the leader of the council, for example, Graham Stringer, who is now an MP, uh, he was very supportive. You know, uh, as one of the cabinet members, I was given full authority to do what I wanted to do, and uh, I could speak on behalf of the council at international level. Mm -hmm. I spoke to, uh, I've spoken to various places in Europe about Manchester, mm -hmm. how, how we do things over here. So really, that's the passion that drove me. Um, to make things happen with the resources mm. because without resources you can't do anything mm. Sure. Mm. Uh, so let me now um, take you into the Labour Party with a bit more of a, um, a snapshot view of what the party stood for so you joined the party and you did work at the council you know, level we then had the era of Tony Blair as uh, the head of the Labour, yes. uh, of, of the Labour Party he was then followed by Gordon Brown, and then you had Ed Miliband, and uh, you then had Jeremy Corbyn for a short stint, and now Keir Starmer. So if you look at it from the point of view of the leadership of the Labour Party, from, from Tony Blair all the way up to now, as Keir Starmer being the leader, do you think the Labour Party has, cha has stayed the same, or has it changed? And if it's changed, how do you think, in a nutshell, the party or the politics of the party has changed? 
I think the way Tony Blair changed the party, remember he changed the party, there's no yeah. doubt about that. He talked about new labor. <clears throat> and uh, that was particularly relevant because if you wanted to hold power in parliament, mm. you needed to address the issues of the middle ground. And if you were able to get seats from the middle ground, then you could form a government. Otherwise, the, the Labour Party had its traditional seats, uh, the Tory Party has its own traditional seats. There are many people in the middle. If you didn't address those, you could never form a government. So Tony Blair took that decision. He addressed the middle party mm. as well, mm. and so which obviously annoyed many people in the left because it was originally a left party. So it became more in the middle as well. Yes. So middle to left. Um, so that was the change he made, and because of that, he was able to form a government, and uh, so the Labour government was able to do things. Um, and I can remember that uh, when Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister, she was not willing to sign the social chapter of the European Union. Mm -hmm. Now, that social chapter was very important for us in the UK, because that gave rights to workers in the factories, and he's also talked about equalities issues, which is my uh, mm. passion. And Tony Blair, when he became the prime minister, he first of all went and signed that social chapter, which meant that the workers in Britain got those rights, which other people, other workers had in, across Europe. And that gave him a lot of you know goodwill as well Absolutely. across uh, across the UK. Um, but in 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 terms of uh, obviously, then he had a very successful you know, tenure as uh, yes. the Prime Minister, uh, steered the Labour Party from strength to strength. Um, and then came uh, the union, in a way, or a partnership with, between the UK and the US during uh, the war on yes. terror. And that led to uh, a lot of unrest. Yes. Um, and, and, and divisions between various communities who did not feel that the government represented them at a very crucial point. And we discussed this even yesterday in our podcast that, that uh, you know, 9-11 was a, a huge turning point um, in, mm. in global politics around the world. Yes. Uh, but I won't go into that, but I will ask you to then compare the Blair Labour with the Labour Party since then up to now how has that changed is the labor party still center to left or do you think it is more now center to right or or is it more you know to the left i think it's, it's since blair the party has moved towards the center more um and we've also seen some what you might say on the right of the party who have actually much more influential within the party itself so it's no longer what was the left of the party. Uh, it's more in the middle. Uh, I think it's recognized now that if it is got to form a government, it needs to get votes from the middle. Mm -hmm. And to get votes from the middle, it has to uh, change some of its policies to attract those people in the middle. Um, this is uh, one of the, th one of the uh, really... Uh, you have to uh, negotiate where where do you stand if you want to form a government how do you want to form a government and what will you do when you form the government do you think uh, the landscape in order to form a government is different now compared to what it was in the 90s so the reason I ask you this question uh, is this that I speak to a lot of people now, young people coming through who are going to be voting in the upcoming elections. And those who voted in the past for Labour feel that the Labour Party no longer represents them. If they feel the Labour is more towards right rather than centre or centre-left. Uh, and, and they feel that Labour has abandoned uh, a lot of uh, the policies that it stood for or it tried to implement uh, and, and, and 
a lot of people now think that because the landscape is changing so much and it is becoming so polarized that uh, in order to form the government, the Labour Party is swinging more towards the right even more than it's ever done in this history. And it's even abandoning not only the left, but abandoning the centre. Um, how would you respond to that? I think some people may actually uh, make that uh, uh, assumption and also uh, see what's happening. But I think the, the, the party, to me, see, you need to realise that the party in Manchester has always been very radical. It is still very radical. Um, if you see what's happening in the Middle East now, or even the past, uh, Manchester has always stood not with the leadership of the Labour Party. It is stood on, on its own. Um, even when uh, the Gulf Wars, going, Gulf Wars was going on, Manchester was not supporting the Labour Party. And even now, uh, with the uh, situation in Gaza, uh, the Manchester Labour Party is totally on one side the rest of the party. So there is a history of Manchester being very radical, which it still is. But I think you're right that uh, uh, to attract more votes and seats in the middle, the party has got to move in the middle. Otherwise, it will never form a government. It could be very radical left-wing party, but it will never form a government. Sure. To form a government, you need to attract people in the middle. Now, what that means is that you have to change certain of your policies to attract those people in the middle. To what extent, but, you know, would you say you one would compromise uh, it's a, it's a, just so you can get into government? Now, if even if that happens, so let's assume that mm -hmm. you do get into government, you've made compromises, you've changed your position, you get into government, and when it actually comes to implementation, uh, now you either stick to uh, the promises you made to your mm. voters to make the government or you take a step back and if you take a step back then uh, you really are uh, again losing the voters who brought you into power now it's always you know fascinated me that you know Tony Blair was able to or, or, or Labour Party under Tony Blair was able to attract the voters in the centre and maintain that for a significantly mm. long period of time and one of the most successful history of government under Labour. But it feels now that the landscape is changing so dramatically and so quickly. Uh, so for example, if you compare the era of Jeremy Corbyn with K. Starmer, there is such a stark difference uh, on the face of it. It appears to be uh, that the party is completely metamorphosized into something mm. other. And I don't know whether deep down that is still the case within the party, and 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 does that cause people within the party to feel you know disconnected? I think this is happening with other parties as well. If you look at the Conservative Party, that's moving to the right as well. Um, and I would not dispute the fact that people will think that the Labour Party is moving to the right as well. Uh, but I think you need to look at what is it that drives the party. Uh, for me personally, I think the party needs to be much more uh, dramatic and brave and bold in putting forward uh, new proposals, for example, on education, so investing in education. Uh, we have not seen that in, uh, investment as we should see, because you will see many schools at the moment are on the brink. Some of them are in deficit, um, and that has never been the case under the Labour Party, uh, Labour government. So we are seeing diff huge changes taking place. So I think the Labour Party needs to be much more uh, bold in saying that we will do this. Similarly, in health issues, uh, the health care and the hospitals, there is not enough investment going into that. Uh, well, if, if, if you now, uh, okay, so, so let's just have a look at that. I mean, at the moment, the Labour Party uh, is significantly up uh, in numbers as far as uh, the public is concerned. Uh, if, if the elections were to take place, it, it would appear that the Labour is on a winning wicket at the moment. Uh, but 
do you think that is this not the right time as you say the Labour Party should be brave and bold is this not the right time for Keir Starmer and Labour Party to come out and really outline uh, exactly what would differentiate Britain mm. under them as opposed to what the Tories stand for now and how we see the landscape you know domestically or internationally even well, the Labour Party has got a mechanism in which it forms its policies and uh, ordinary members get involved in that that takes time it is a process to go through and then you have to have a uh, working parties work on that uh, proposals come to the Labour Party conference and that is where the policies are made at the conference. The leader himself cannot do on his own. I think this is this is the issue. Uh, if the election takes place this year then you're not going to get any new policies because the party hasn't gone through that. Uh, it takes time to actually do that. Um, but do you not but think then this is an opportunity you know, lost because everybody expected and has been expecting elections to take place this year. And is that not then a failure of the leadership within the Labour Party uh, for not uh, proactively putting these measures into place? But this is, this, is good. this is true for all parties because they're, they're all having their uh, conferences this year and uh, it is quite likely that the elections will take place after the, the conferences have taken place. And I think new policies, if there are any, will be coming coming through at that time. So we have to wait and see. But I think if you look at what the parties stand for at the moment, uh, it could be anybody's game, I think. Could I ask? Yeah. You, know, you mentioned earlier about the realisation that the Labour Party is having of having to adjust its policies to attract a wider audience. Do you think it's doing it purely for the sake of attracting a wider audience or do you think it's doing it because it thinks it's the right thing to do? Different people will have different views on this. Right. Uh, I believe that if you want to make any change, you need to be in power. Mm. Uh, to be in power, you need to get seats in parliament. Mm. And to get seats in parliament, you have to convince people that they should vote for you. Mm. So I think this is a very tricky game. Uh, you can't be saying in one part of the country one policy and another part of the country a totally different policy. You can't have that. So you have to have some uh, leeway in how you present yourself. Um, the other parties are doing the same thing. Um, and we've seen that in Manchester. We, we do the same thing as well. And this is one of the reasons why we keep winning seats in Manchester. Mm. Of the 96 seats, mm. I think only four or five which are not Labour. Mm. Let me then Labor. focus you more on where we are today. Uh, yes. So we've discussed in length your past, your political um, involvement, um, the Labour Party itself. Um, so we've, we've had discussions in terms of where we are today as a Muslim community. There is a lack of political will in certain aspects. So, for example, we were discussing Islamophobia yesterday, uh, that there is a lack of political will in order to agree on a definition of Islamophobia, which can then be entrenched in law, uh, which would then assist in uh, enforcement uh, against Islamophobia. So, in your view, what is the best way for Muslims now? to develop that political uh, will, to, 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 to develop a narrative uh, with which we can move forward? Well, you know that uh, Michael Gove is already decide, is actually putting forward a definition of Islamophobia and uh, bringing in uh, various aspects which are new to British politics. But we've uh, heard these promises in the past for many, many years. No, but he's doing that now. He's doing that. He's, he's actually published those. So I think what needs to happen is the Muslim community, which is organized, is a organized, well-organized Muslim community in the UK, they need to respond to that. Uh, rather than just responding, it sh should have created its own definition and uh, presented that definition. Because this is what other people do. The, if you look at uh, the mm -hmm. uh, definition of anti-Semitism, a lot of that has come from the Jewish community. 
they have said we will define what anti-Semitism is. And I think the Muslims should now say we will define what is meant by uh, Islamophobia or anti-Muslim sentiments or anti-Muslim hate, the hatred against hatred. Muslims. So we, we need to do that. Because remember, Islamophobia just means fear of the unknown. Mm. Whereas anti-Semitism means something else. Mm. That is, talks about hatred and, and uh, against the, the Jewish community. You don't get that from the Muslim community. The Muslim community should be insisting mm. that uh, the law should talk about hate against Muslims and how to tackle that. How, how do we go about correctly, to use your word, insisting exactly what you're suggesting? Well, what happens is you, you actually, first of all, discuss amongst yourselves all these organizations which represent Muslims. They need to work together to, to formulate the definition. Once they formulate themselves, then they need to engage the political parties, not one political party, all of them. Um, and uh, have a national debate. It takes time in a democratic system, but you have to do that. Do you think part of the problem has been that the Conservative Party has been very reluctant to work with any Muslim organizations, such as the MCB and others? And uh, has that been part of the hindrance in this? Not necessarily. I think if you look at uh, uh, how do you project the Muslim community uh, people will argue that the Conservative Party has been very, very successful in doing that, whereas the Labour Party has not done as much as the Conservative Party has done. It is the engagement of the Muslim community itself within those parties that have actually uh, brought about some successes. Um, I mean, you can see how many politicians there are in the UK holding top positions who are from the Muslim community, um, and then you will you will know that the 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 highest office is the mayor of London. Uh, yes. Now he is a Muslim. You've got a Muslim who's leading the uh, leading Scotland, um, and really you you have those in place. Uh, but how do you have the impact? That is an important question. Um, you're right, we, we, the Muslim community needs to be very focused on what he wants to do and uh, do that. I mean, I, I have my own views, but the point is, uh, collectively, the Muslim community, uh, as you, you, you have rightly pointed out, that in the current climate uh, is, has not come forward as one body. Uh, but the other tragedy also is that the, in the Palestinians, they have not come together as one body either. Mm. So there, is, uh, so it is everywhere is the same same situation. I'll, I'll, in, in, again, uh, you know, you say that the Conservative Party has done more in terms of the awareness for Muslims or representation, but there have been numerous reports again and again within the Conservative Party. Uh, you, you, and, and, and we touched on this even yesterday mm. that there's a professor, Swaran Singh, who did a report who was heading the UK's um, Race and Equality Commission. And uh, one of the primary findings of his report were uh, in, in, in respect of the anti Muslim uh, sentiment within the Conservative Party and that the majority of the uh, complaints within the Conservative Party. Uh, was in respect of anti-Muslim, uh, you know, sentiment. Um, now, if if uh, if you look at uh, where we are today in terms of the landscape, for example, what's happening in Palestine at the moment, uh, obviously, uh, foreign policy is something you know different to domestic. Uh, how do you think Muslims can have more of an impact at a national? level where we can begin to influence foreign policy or at least be on the table to have a discussion? I think we, we have got a number of Muslim MPs. Uh, we've got quite a few Muslim members of the House of Lords. There are a large number of Muslim councillors across the UK. Um, 
I think that they need to get together, basically, uh, have a formal body that represents the elected people from the Muslim community uh, who can then negotiate uh, with the, and engage the, the main political parties um, to actually bring about policies which are beneficial to the Muslim community. Uh, at the moment, you've got a large number of councillors and MPs from the Labour Party, uh, but we have not seen any really strong uh, results from that. Um, and people will ask questions why. I mean, I can give my own views, and that is to say that uh, I, I can say in Manchester we are quite organized, but whereas nationally you look at that, uh, we don't have um, a national body that represents the Muslim community as a whole. There are organizations, and uh, because the organizations, many of them rely on government funding, public funding. So if you fall foul of one of those, then your funding will be stopped. Of course. That's what's happened with the Tory party and the MCB. Yeah, and obviously then that leads to a handicap in what you can and cannot say. Well, I think in that case, my view is very simple, that the, the Muslim community should put hands in its own pocket and fund their own activities and not rely on public funds at all. So um, mm. we also um, saw uh, there was the operation, you know, Black Vote. Yes. So right now where we are today, what do you think we can learn from that? I mean, I was part of that uh, in the early days, Operation Black Vote, and that was really a campaign to engage, to well, let people, black people know that they've got to vote, their vote is valuable, and they should vote. Um, and that wasn't confined just for the black community itself. When black, I mean political black, which meant... Uh, others as well ethnic minorities ethnic minorities in general but particularly the black people uh, from Africa and from Caribbean who were organized to cast their vote to register for votes first of all and then to make sure they went and cast their votes as well mm. and uh, I think we the Muslim community has got to learn from that and uh, do similar things but then, as you, as you pointed earlier on, it costs money. And unless you're putting put our own resources on the table, nobody's going to do it for us. How so, do you engage the community to such a level where not only do you raise the political awareness, but you actually mobilize the community, do you think, in such a way that it actively uh, engages in politics, it actively engages with local councillors, local MPs uh, and actually forces debates and discussions how, how, how do we in your view from your exposure uh, within Manchester within the Labour Party how do you think we can mobilize the Muslim community in Manchester to begin with to me it seems that uh, I think one of the things we need to do is to uh, instill within the, or get the community to recognize that they need to do something for the rest of the community. As an individual, um, I need to say what I can do for other people rather than what do I benefit from my community. I think once we get that uh, ethos uh, that we have to do something for other people, uh, we can organize ourselves. There are many, there are many organizations available uh, uh, on the ground in the UK and uh, it's a matter of getting them together, uh, forming a grand alliance, if you like, uh, in the UK um, to address all issues that affect the Muslim community. Um, <coughs> otherwise, we are fragmented. Once you're fragmented, nobody will listen to you. Uh, there's you no need... shortage of talent in the community, is there? Well, the point is, how do you... Talent is there, yeah. but a lot of that is personal talent. Mm. It stays with the individual. How is how do you get that into the community? Um, I would say, for, for example, I mean, I've, I worked in, with the African community in Manchester quite quite a while, and the African community is quite clear 
that they expect the people who are successful in the communities to put 10% of their time into the community. If they can't give the time, then they put money into the community and they fund projects in the community so that people get much more involved. Um, there's no reason why the Muslim community can't actually learn from other communities uh, how to organize ourselves and to... Uh, there, there was a time when there was a, um, a, a forum of uh, Muslim councillors in the UK and the then Nazir Ahmad, councillor Nazir Ahmad at that time, later became the Lord, uh, he was leading that. So that there, were, there are mechanisms which were in place, uh, but we have not seen a lot more impact from them. I think this is the question is, how do you get Im impact? impact now you ask the question, how do you engage, how do you motivate the communities? I think communities need to be motivated in the sense that we have got to do something for other people. Um, and I think our faith actually teaches us that, that it is not what you gain out of it, it is what you do for other people. And that is the value. Um, you can easily realize that once you start uh, people getting people together and you find that the talent is there, the resources are there, mm -hmm. why do we have to rely on public public funds? Sure. Mm -hmm. So let me then um, focus you a bit more um, on, on, on the, hopefully, the forthcoming elections, the local and national elections. Yes. Um, a lot of discussion is taking place and has taken place over the past few months because of the situation which has arisen in Gaza and the um, and, and 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 the onslaught uh, by Israel on on Gaza, the bombing and the killing of the Palestinians, mm -hmm. and uh, the disconnect that the Muslim community and others feel, and not just the Muslim community but others feel. Uh, with representation that um, uh, they receive at local and national uh, you know, politics. A lot of people are now considering uh, standing for elections as independents rather than with the Labour Party because they feel uh, the Labour Party no longer represents them. And there have been some high profile people who've distanced themselves more recently from Labour. Um, and I talk about Labour primarily here because in Manchester, Labour, as you have rightly pointed out previously, have always had the majority and Labour has held the majority. So in Manchester at the moment, uh, what would you say to those who want to stand independently? I think in British politics, independents are dying, have never been actually been successful. Um, you have got people actually elected on party politics uh, because is, there is, in Britain you have large political parties and if you want to succeed then that's where you go. As an independent, I can't see anybody being elected to parliament. Uh, you might get elected in local councils because then you're talking about a few hundred votes rather than thousands of votes. Um, and I don't see there is any future in actually people looking for as independents. What you, what should happen is you you work within your political parties. You can work within the political parties and have an impact within the parties themselves, rather than saying, "All right, because one of my conditions is not met by this party, I'll leave it." Because remember, the the parties represent twenty or different areas of policy. You may disagree with one of them, but you may agree with m most of the others. So you can't just say, I'm going to leave this party to do something else. You may stand on one issue, and we've had that in Greater Manchester in the by-election, where uh, one issue was the deciding factor, but that's not going to be in the general election. In general election, things actually change. Things are different. Um, so I don't see independence have got any uh, future really. Even in, in Rochdale, it wasn't an independent. The mm. independence didn't get anywhere. No, but of course, but uh, I, I, I suppose part of the, uh, I suppose uh, the reason people want to stand as independence is that even if 
they believe they don't win, they will split the vote yeah. and that may cause uh, damage to one party or another and that may force those parties to pay more closer attention uh, to those who particularly mm. feel uh, that they are underrepresented or, or not represented at all on foreign policy issues and in particular now uh, um, the issue of Israel and, and, and Palestine mm. and that is not just the Muslim vote it is considerably large proportions of the community um, so f- um, it, it may well be the case that you're right that in uh, national uh, elections that may not be the, deci- the deciding in a factor I suppose uh, time will tell as to what happens mm. uh, and whether and whether the the difficulties in uh, Palestine continue to escalate or they get you know better and how um, how uh, much of that will remain at the forefront of the political issues um, would you then say you see you know one of the other questions in in discussions that I have normally had with people uh, and politicians uh, either local or national when you speak to them on any particular issue and especially issues which are uh, sensitive uh, they are reluctant to speak openly about them and they will say well I have to toe the party line and I am unable to speak openly about these things uh, and and again people feel that either politicians hide behind that or they feel that politicians are or they don't have enough courage to speak about something that they stand for I think and what's your view on that you raised quite a few issues there I think um, uh, for me, um, if you're looking at my advice, my advice would be don't go independent. You are part of a political system. You work within the political parties and get your political parties to take note of what, what you are about. And uh, if you talk the Labour Party, they're not s- small numbers. They're large numbers of people within the party and they can... Uh, make change within the party itself. Mm. I think that is the way to go forward politically. Uh, yes, you may have independents who uh, might, uh, their votes which they get in the general election, uh, some of the seats may be lost with the Labour Party, but the parties don't actually work on that basis in the UK. Uh, they look at the big picture. If, if uh, and the Tory party is the same. Um, there are people disappointed within the Tory party, uh, but they don't actually just say we will go independent. Yeah, if we take your uh, suggestion about working within the, the political parties, and we were discussing about Manchester, the Labour, Manchester Labour Party having co- quite different views to their overall yes. uh, in, in before. Um, has there been situations in the past where essentially the view of Manchester, it, because it's so different to the overall party, has been considered and actually adopted because of that? Well, the, the thing is, yes, you have, you have a view. I'm going to give you the example of the, the Gulf War. Uh, Manchester was against uh, the Gulf War. Um, it's well known. Uh, but then again, you're talking in a political, in a democratic political system, you can't make your view uh, dominant just by by saying my I'm right mm. and the others are wrong you have to take other people with you and you need to have time to actually discuss that and do that sometimes you win many times you don't win but that doesn't mean that you turn against your, your own political party uh, that's not the way to do things it is work within the party um, I'm not giving you my example in Manchester there are certain things I believed in and I worked tirelessly to make sure that the party followed that. Uh, it wasn't easy. Um, you talk about race, race equality. That wasn't a big thing within the party itself in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, but I, I recognized that. So I made sure I put a lot of my time and my, I got my other colleagues to support me in ensuring that we had race equality was part and parcel of our policies. So this is the best way to work. Um, I can understand people want to be independent. They can be, uh, but their political life is very limited. 
Okay, um, we've been discussing various issues for nearly an hour now. I, my final, I think, uh, point that I want to ask you about and, and get your thoughts on is uh, there's also been recent discussions uh, on Muslim vote you know, matters. Does the Muslim vote matter to such an extent, in your view, that it can uh, sway the results one way or the other in Manchester? So let's talk about you know, Manchester. And secondly, uh, the the you know, second part of that question is, um, if the Muslim vote at this moment in time does not have that persuasive power, how do we get there? In the current situation, I don't believe the Muslim community has got that many votes that can change the outcome of an election. I don't think it is that... Uh, clear um, but I think what we need to do is we need to engage the community make it volatile make it much more radical to understand that it is a civic duty to get involved in political activity whether, and you you can join any political party you want to join I'm not I'm not saying join one one of those but the political party of your choice and you work within that party um, and really you should use your vote you talk about voting you should use your vote is very very important uh, the worst thing can happen is if a minority of people actually vote and a minority of people make the governments and the majority keep silent that's not the way to do things you should be able to uh, cast your votes get people to cast cast their votes. First of all, you need to register and cast your votes um, and then hope for the best, basically. Now, the other question you asked was, what's gonna, how do we people actually organize themselves? Um, that is for the future. And I think we need to start now getting a young people involved in politics, understand what politics is all about. Mm. Uh, and because you don't get overnight results, it takes time. And uh, we need to have the time scale under which people can actually get involved. Uh, just like Operation Blackboard didn't happen overnight. It was, a, it was really um, an effort for a long period of time to get people to register and vote. Janab, I am very grateful for the time that you've uh, afforded us. Uh, I'm grateful for Hafsab again for, for of, of, you know, giving I, I us think this platform I'm, I'm, this I've got a few questions. And with the permission of the cameraman, uh, an extension of a few more minutes. Sure. See, to my left, we have president of uh, MCM. To my right hand side, we have somebody with a lifelong experience of serving the community from a political background. The last final words that you mentioned that, you know, uh, we need to get community involvement, engagement. From an Islamic point of view, uh, Masajid play a significant role in mobilizing our communities, for us at least. I know the OBV worked in, in, in a different way. That's obviously a blueprint we have, a working example model. How can we implement an element of that into the Muslim community? Because the stigma is that if Masajid get involved, they become political. If an Imam speaks on a subject, he's becoming political. So there's always been like a separation of powers between the Masajid, the Imams and politics, particularly I've seen post uh, colonial times. Whereas prior to that, if you look at it, Masajid, Imams, they were embedded in politics. For the last hundred years, we've seen that, that absence and that void. Until today, we still feel that there's that, 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 that stigma. How can we use the, this, 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 this incredibly powerful platform we have and engage in these uh, great tasks that we hold as a responsibility to deliver to our coming generations? I think, the, the, <laughs> um, I think we mis, misunderstand politics. When you say politics, people think you're talking about the Conservative Party, the Labour Party and the other parties. 
Um, by politics, I mean uh, you're talking about issues which people have and how those issues can be resolved, can be addressed. And that is through power. And the power, that is what politics is all about. I don't think you should uh, hold back on that. You can talk about that. Or all I would say is don't uh, support one party against another. Uh, what's happened in the past is uh, people have actually gone to the imams and said, look, I'm standing for elections. Can you support me? And the imam has said, this is a good candidate. Support this, this person. Uh, now, in my life lifetime, I've never been to a mosque, asked them to support me. So this is not the job of the imam to, uh, to actually uh, support one candidate against another. It is the communities to do that. But you can talk in general terms on politics, the people should get involved. That's important. And I think uh, massages have got uh, young people's forums and we can utilize those. Uh, uh, all I can say is from my, my point, viewpoint, I can come and talk to those young people uh, on what needs to be done, how they need to get involved. Uh, but they, remember, these results, results are not overnight. It takes time. Uh, but they need to get involved. Um, some of my colleagues have actually uh, tried this many times. I've tried it many times to get young people together and but unfortunately many of them have said what is in it for me i think the this is what i was saying earlier on it is what i can do for others for, um, for, for many it's, it's, it's difficult it's, getting involved because everything there's always a, a financial factor background to it somebody's going to get involved into politics let's say okay a parent has a child you rather want that child to become a pharmacist a doctor an engineer yes who have actually thinks about your child becoming a politician? What money do they make? No, but How they, will they survive? Things don't happen like that. I'm not, I'm not saying you you don't do your work. You do your work. Uh, all I can I can go from my own example. I was I was in full time employment. But yet I found time to do politics. Hmm. So you've got to have a passion See, for it, really. Passion for it. For example, I'll give you an example. I was working for International Computers Limited in Manchester when I got elected and I needed to have 24 days a year to spend on my politics, 24 days a year. And I agreed with my employer that they will give me 14 days of work, paid work. And the other 14 I had to take from my annual leave. Now I took that choice. I said, yes, I want to do that. And the reason I, I told you I was involved in equalities issues because many of those meetings I could hold in the evenings rather than the daytime. So I didn't have to take time off work every time to do that. But it affected me because my managers were telling me whenever, you know, at the end of the year you do assessments and they were telling me, oh, you're always away. I mean, it's not always away. <laughs> it's only 28 half days in a year was away. So but then it, it comes on the... The no, what, what, so what happens is you lose out on your promotions. Yeah. But that is the price you pay yeah. mm. for doing this extra work. Mm. But I, th I think you know, one of the fundamental points here is, is uh, and I say this all the time, it's not what you say, it's how you say it that makes the difference. So you can take any platform, including this one, yes. you can take any platform and discuss any points as long as one, you are knowledgeable on what you're discussing, mm. Two, you have, uh, you have the knowledge on how to express that and convey the message, and three, that uh, you are, as you've said, that you are not. If if you if you're really going to express, you know, something, then you need to be able to uh, really communicate in such a way where a bias isn't transmitted. You actually deal with the issues themselves, yes. uh, and 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 educate, you know, people. Um, and as I think as far as you know Masajid are concerned Masajid have always been active and even now are active that is not to say that they cannot be more active more mm. work needs to be done uh, you know certainly and again I, I, I would agree with you I think you know politics is not about um, choosing one party mm. over another mm. just mm. for the sake of you know voting it is first of all, first and foremost in my view identifying the issues within a community within a group 
within a city uh, and then after that you know nationally and then uh, paving a way to address those issues uh, organizing uh, and being part of the discussions and debates uh, that in itself does take time and a lot of the politicians who get into politics hold full-time jobs to begin with and eventually yes. and they work in the evenings or on the weekends and they dedicate their time it is in it's exactly the same as people for example who want to uh, who have hobbies uh, you know politics is a hobby for some people and they have a hobby and they do this uh, in the evenings they'll go and play you know badminton or football or cricket or swimming or they'll go to the gym you give yourself that time and it is exactly the same thing. Well, remember things have changed now. Times have changed. Mm -hmm. Now the councillors got a wage. Yes. MPs got a hefty wage. So really they, they can't then say we are out of pocket. Um, so things have changed quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. my, my mm -hmm. view was simply is this, that uh, to, getting, to get involved in political activity, you need to first of all see what is your passion. You can't do. You can't solve everything, but you you take one particular issue. For example, I, I mean, I took education. I took equalities. The other colleagues who who deal with the health issues, who may deal with the highways, who may deal with roads, but you they concentrate on that. Become an expert on that. I think what the masajid can do, they can they can actually set up think tanks where peop, you can do some research bring the information for our young people to actually have that knowledge to be able to move forward. That, that's the way to do that. Mm, yeah. the, the, the other thing which, which we need to learn is from the Jewish community. Nationally, the Jewish community is very, very influential. Mm. Why is that? It is because over a hundred years ago, they realized that nobody's going to listen to them unless they come together. Mm. So you have your the board of deputies in the UK, the parliament has got to listen to that. Yeah. Now we need to, we need to, I think be, I'm not saying do more work. I think in, in English parlance, it is do smart, smart work, work. Smart work. Yeah. do smartly. Yeah. The least amount of effort, the most amount of output. results. Output. Yeah. And, yes. I, and I think just one thing in regards to how we can do things better and smarter. It seems like concluding from your, your, your suggestions on how, how do we kind of make an impact and engage the, the youth the, 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 from, from our communities, it seems like your suggestion is really we need to go into a, a, a direction where essentially the community well-being is as important, if not more important, than the, satisfying the self-pleasures and the self-desires at an individual level. Mm -hmm. Now... I think that's where the mosque can play a part because compassion to creation is one of the objectives of life according to Islam. And I think this is where the Imams can really help kind of build those values uh, within the youth that will then lead to think tanks and all of these others. Yes. Um, yeah, I think really insightful ending. Um, but I think the beginning was needed to understand and appreciate the political arena, your background. And I think every word you've said, um, comes with a a lifetime of experience and knowledge awareness on this uh, political subject inshallah i mean i mean the the, the ultimately is that the ummah unites Amen. i mean now uh, the one binding point or uniting point for the entire ummah in the uk at least is the palestinian cause if you're not going to unite now then mm. i don't think ever now is it the right time to really raise that awareness and build that uh, political awareness so starting from the grassroots levels, educating the youth, like you said, uh, yes. target a particular niche and a, a sector that they want to specialize in and then give them massage to facilitate and uh, give them those roles. But uh, Nasrullah Sahib, thank you very, very much for your That's time. My pleasure. Oh, it's, 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 it's been, uh, I do know, remember, um, it's a caveat. I don't expect people to agree with me. Okay. Um, there are <laughs> very various views available. Okay. I've expressed my views. Which I think are relevant to the local to our communities. No, Jazakallah. Uh, thank you very much. People may Zain, have other views. It's been highly insightful, thank and so uh, Bilal Bhai, thank you, and Hamad Bhai. Um, I believe you're also going to be sitting in the Kaf now soon. Inshallah. So uh, remember us in your du'as. Remember the Ummah in your du'as. Jazakallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.